Back to you, Tara. Thank uh-huh, you, Fatima. Those are very strong calls. Uh-huh, quickly, quickly. Perfect. Not just compassion, but deep compassion. You also suggested that we become more adaptive. We have to listen. Patients have to increase capacity. I also agree that COVID exacerbated the fault lines of the health system. Death and disease resonate with all our organizations. And this forces us to re-examine what we do and hit that reboot button. That's why we're also here today to help each other navigate through new ways of caring and learning and new ways of behavior, as Fatima said. And we need to humanize the health system. Thank you again, Fatima. And once again, thank you, Professor Tan. We will now begin the first session of our Congress. The first session is entitled WHO Compassionate, Integrated and People-Centered Universal Health Coverage, Patient Journeys in a Fragmented versus an Integrated Health System. We are very honored to be joined by the moderator of this session, Dr. Esperanza Cabral, Secretary of Health. When you say Dr. Esperanza Cabral, you associate her with humility and service. Our speakers are Professor Lee Chen. Wells, CEO of Consumers Health Forum of Australia, Nitita Prasopa Plazir, Education and Capacity Development, Maternal Child Health and Quality Safety of the World Health Organization, Western Pacific Region. You can find their full biographies on the official Congress website. Please send your questions through the Q&A tab in the auditorium. I now invite Dr. Esperanza Cabral to take the virtual floor. Over to you, Dr. Cabral. Thank you very much, Cara, and uh, good day and uh, good evening to all of the participants in this third Asia-Pacific Patients Congress. I also, of course, want to greet the organizers, in particular, the International Alliance for Patient Organizations, Sing Health, as well as the Philippine Alliance of Patient Organizations. It seems that uh, this first session of the Congress is an extension of the keynote address of Father Jerry Orbos, because what we are going to be discussing will be the WHO agenda on the delivery of respectful, compassionate, and people-centered health care. A long time ago, uh, a professor from Harvard Medical School, Dr. Francis Peabody, said to young doctors that he was advising that the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. And within and amidst the rapidly advising medical technology that we have, we are going full circle and coming to the true purpose of why patient uh, healthcare workers are here. And they are our purpose, the patients. These are what we are going to discuss this morning or evening, how to overcome fragmented healthcare, overcome loss of trust and goodwill in healthcare, recharge our batteries, and restore quality of healthcare. We have three distinguished speakers who will discuss this with us. And the first one is Professor Lee Chen Ern, Deputy Group CEO of Singapore Health Services. Let us now hear from Professor Lee. Professor Lee. Good morning, everyone, and uh, greetings uh, from Singapore and from Singapore Health Services. Uh, today, it is my uh, thank the uh, organizers for giving this opportunity to share uh, at this session. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, I've entitled my talk, uh, Compassionate People-Centered Care in an Integrated Health System. And uh, I'm from Sing Health, and we play uh, both a national and a regional role. Uh, in our national role through our national centers for eye, cancer, neurosciences, uh, and uh, dental services and heart services. We care for the country, but in our regional services, uh, we care for the population in the East. And our uh, next slide, and how we have tried to do this uh, is, uh, uh, next slide please, yeah, is uh, through uh, 12 geographical based, uh, what we call communities of care. Uh, each of them 
uh, supported by one of our acute hospitals. And for each community of care, we organize our services around the life journey of our residents, uh, not just our patients, but anyone who is living there. And we then also, uh, the why we organize it into these 12, uh, what we call communities of care, is so that we can have a deep understanding of the needs as well as the aspirations of the communities that we serve. As uh, each community may have different demographics, it may have uh, different social economic levels. And so we thought that we need to be able to listen and to know uh, what are their specific needs and also aspirations. And we want to do this in co-production with the community in the physical and the virtual realm because we recognize we cannot and we should not do everything ourselves. So what we intend to do is to help our residents keep well, get well and live well with this common vision, but delivered locally. Next. So our approach is a, a three-pronged approach uh, based on three stackable models. First is through taking care of the patients that are already with us through uh, our next gen primary care. The next is a health up, which is taking care of the patients that have not been reached yet, or those who have been reached but have been lost to follow up, and or those who have reached are still well, and how do we keep them well? And the third prong is then for the each uh, community of care, uh, can we enable the residents to know what they need to do, that they care about what they should do, and they are able to do it, and to take this whole of life journey to address what actually matters most to them, not only for health, but in terms of social and in terms of their life aspirations. Next slide, please. So in terms of the next generation of primary care, what we have developed is a modular plug and play model that depending on the needs of the patients, uh, we can then uh, provide the services accordingly. It is anchored in the primary care provider, but supported by an integrated community care-based team that is made up of a community nurse, a health social integrator, as well as our social partners. And this team need not be made up of our staff, but it can be made up of whoever is willing and prepared to come along with us uh, in this journey. Our focus is on the patient. And our target population here are those with chronic diseases. They can come from various sources, such as for screening. And what we want to do is to bring care to the clinics, to the home, as well as in the community through what we have here in Singapore, what are our senior activity centers. And we will do this through face-to-face, -face, virtual care, as well as a hybrid. And the goal is that it is to provide that holistic care to improve the care of our patients with one single care team with clear roles and responsibilities and one single care plan with clear common targets. And this care plan includes lifestyle interventions as well as clinical and social follow-up. And we intend to put in an IT system that enables this to work. And you can see from the journey, it is a lot of the work integrated is there because we want to work as one single team, which and the team includes the patient in, uh, in this care team too. Next slide, please. And we, the whole spirit is to work collaboratively and is underpinned by this principle of uh, asset-based community development. And the key principles of uh, this philosophy of principles is that everyone has gifts and has something to contribute. Whether you are the nurse, whether you are a social partner, whether you're a primary care provider, whether you're a patient, whether you're a caregiver, or whether you're a volunteer, everyone has gifts and has something to contribute. So we want to start with what the community has instead of looking at what it lacks. And we also take it that it built on relationships build community. And therefore, we want to connect people into communities of what is possible and what could be done. And we view persons as actors instead of just passive recipients. So we want uh, whoever is in the community as well as our partners to be a co-producer of us instead of just consuming the services. And we want to do this by listening and by asking through generative conversations. Next slide. So one of the things that we try to do is what we call social prescribing, where we, we because we have prescribing med medications, we prescribe uh, uh, also now 
prescribing exercise, you don't want to prescribe also social interventions that may meet the needs of the patients. So in terms of social prescribing, again, we see the individual as a whole person and not just as a patient. And we recognize that effective healthcare should include social and lifestyle risk factors. And it's co-developed and individualized in non-clinical care plan, taking into account the wider determinants of health and the individual's interests and needs to improve their health. And what we want to do also is to connect the patient through their community in areas that are of mutual interest to them as well as activities. And we want to work collaboratively with the multidisciplinary care team that I just shared earlier and partners in the community. And this has been, this actually is an international movement which we have adopted and adapted for Singapore, starting with our polyclinics and our community hospitals, which actually initiated it. And we have put in place a well-being coordinator that will help our patients and our residents uh, to navigate the system. They co-develop a personalized plan. We activate community assets and we establish the relationship. And this, the whole focus is on what matters to them, whether it is from social activities, their finances, their uh, and their health. Um, these are the questions which we will address together with the resident and whoever we are engaging. Next slide, please. And so the next initiative is that of Health Up, where we are working on co-creating a health-promoting community. So this is through our community outreach, through our workplaces and our community touch points. Some of them are maybe more unique to Singapore, but what we want to do is then to screen, to triage them and to enroll them into uh, programs involved in clinical and lifestyle intervention. And we also are working on improving the lived environment because we believe that the environment in which people live in affects their health. So uh, we are working with our uh, uh, in Tampines, which is a township in uh, one of the largest townships in Singapore, uh, to see how we can make it more green and have uh, make exercise more uh, conducive and more accessible, and so that it becomes a garden within the city. Next, next slide, please. And what we we are planning to launch it soon, and uh, we have great support from our. Uh, uh, the person that you see here is actually our Senior Minister of State for Health. And we are collaborating with our sports aid agency as well as with our Health Promotion Board, which is a national agency for health promotion, to uh, work on both the exercise as well as the lifestyle intervention. And we are targeting the 40 to 65 because we find that this is the age when people start to develop the chronic diseases. And we are engaging the GPs, so that they, the general practitioners, so that they come in. So this is both a uh, public, private, as well as a people sector involvement, and with certain rewards that we put in place for achieving key health uh, targets. Next. And uh, only we come to this, uh, which is a network that uh, we learned from uh, Young Shepping in uh, Sweden, and it's an international network. Again, again, we have adopted it for Singapore. And in this network, it, it is um, three P's here. It is about a philosophy, it is about a process by which we garner uh, the responses of those we are reaching out to. And it is also all about people. So in this person-centered philosophy, we start with what matters to our Esthers. And Esthers could be a patient, it could be a caregiver, it could be a volunteer. And we co-produce for tangible goals. So it could be things like a quality improvement project. And we have then mass customization and upskilling of this project so that it can benefit the rest. These projects could be in the hospital because our patients may say, this doesn't look, it's not patient friendly. Or it could be out in the community uh, to help with medication compliance. It could be in many other areas to assist mobility. And we have a framework to develop the partnerships. So I thought I would just end with a few comments from our Esther's in the next slide, where, So uh, as you can see, these are the faces. Uh, we've got the uh, consent for them to be showed here. And we share our patient's perspective for the ecosystem to understand the things that people value. That, that's what they find meaningful to be an Esther ambassador. It's about coming together with a new trajectory for patients, looking at what is possible rather than what they lack. And it's the most sustainable way of doing up. And they felt that this is the best gift that they feel that they can contribute towards this. And can we do more? That's what I would say. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and I look forward to the panel discussion later. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Professor Lee, uh, for that uh, interesting discussion on what is being done in Singapore uh, for patient-focused holistic care. And uh, Esther seems like such a very good program. Our next speaker is, um, <laughs> wait a minute. I think it's Leanne Wells, is it? Yes, uh, now we are going to have uh, to speak to us, Ms. Leanne Wells, the CEO of Consumers Health Forum of Australia. Ms. Wells, welcome to the program. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here with everybody um, and good afternoon. It's afternoon here in Australia. If I could have the next slide, please. It's customary in Australia when we speak officially to acknowledge the first peoples of our nation, the traditional custodians of our land. So I'd like to do that today. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country on, on of the land I'm on today, and that's here in Canberra, and they are known as the Ngunnawal people. I'd like to recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay my respects to them and their cultures and to their elders past, present and yet to come. Next slide, please. So what I really would like to cover today in my 10 minutes is why we deliberately chose to use the term consumer and not patient in Australia, the various roles that consumers can play and are playing in our system, ways to promote consumer leadership, approaches to capacity building, and to give some, I guess, illustrative, illustrative examples of how um, consumers and their insights and their lived experience and their knowledge of the system have been harnessed as agents of change. Uh, so the impact of consumer advocacy, if you like, in the Australian healthcare system. Next slide, please. So why consumers and not, not patients? Well, it was a deliberate decision in Australia when my organisation was established about 40 years ago to adopt the term consumer. Um, here we define patients as a, a person uh, receiving or registered to receive medical treatment. But it is a more passive term limited to interaction at the time care and treatment is delivered. From our point of view, consumer is a broader term encompassing everyone who may use the health system or have a connection with it now or in the future. So patients are a subset, if you like, of the broader group of consumers. We also like the term consumer because it suggests choice, it suggests control, it suggests agency. So it's about seeing the consumer as a more active, and as previous speakers have talked about, more active participant in healthcare, but also a more actor, more of an active actor in shaping policy, research, and services. Next slide, please. So we've certainly seen, and this is this is right across the globe, isn't it? That um, as consumers uh, experience healthcare system and the other, other systems connected with healthcare like aged care and social care, that they want to be involved in all levels of decision making. They want to be enabled to make informed decisions and choices about their healthcare. They want to feel trusted and respected. Uh, so that's the patient rights agenda by services providers and managers and funders. Most importantly, universalism, they want to have access to affordable, coordinated and quality health care, which is focused on the whole person. They want to be engaged in collaborative and partnership approaches to service planning and improvement. And they want to serve as the engine room for improving and innovating health and social care services. Next slide, please. So what... Um, this is just to give you a sense of the strategy for my organisation. It's our strategy on a page. I'm not going to go through that in any detail other than to point you to objective two there, consumer shaping health. We're a, a national organising coalition of patient and consumer organisations in Australia. And one of our key goals and aspirations is to support consumers 
to engage with and influence and advocate for a better health system. So it's very much core business for us to be working with consumers to help them shape policy and research and programs and services. Next slide, please. So what have we been doing uh, to support that role of the consumer as an actor in the system? One of the things we've wanted to do for a long time and we're really starting to influence the national narrative around this is we wanted to mature the way policymakers and researchers and service designers think about consumers and to think about them as change makers or co-producers of, of better outcomes. So how do we go about influencing that narrative? We produced a, what we grandly called a white paper called Consumers Transforming Health in 2018. One of the things that white paper did, apart from look at some of the major health policy shifts we wanted to advocate for, were that it identified eight different archetypes or eight different types of roles that consumers can play and should play in the system. Because we often found talking to governments and talking to policymakers that consumers were being grouped into one generic homogenous group when actually they can play very different roles in the system. Next slide, please. We like our strategies on a page here at CHF. This is, this is a summary of that white paper I was talking about on a page. And on the right hand side of that page are the eight types of roles that we uh, identified that consumers could play. They can, can serve as change agents, they can serve as policy influencers, they can serve uh, as community mobilisers, they serve as volunteers working with local uh, primary health networks and some of the more local constructs here in Australia that deliver services. They can co-design services. They can collaborate as researchers, as, in, as, as actual research investigators uh, and translators of research. They can educate, they can serve as educators and, and we're seeing a lot more of that where consumer advocates and consumer leaders are much more integrally involved in delivering, delivering some elements of medical and healthcare curriculum here in Australia. Um, and the notion of expert patients, I know that emerged in the UK, but the idea that um, patients are the people who are experts in their care. So building health literacy so that patients are expert in self-managing and expert in self-care and expert in making informed decisions about their care. And of course, the other important role for consumers is that they are payers uh, or co-payers of the system. So that's, that was just a way of really saying, you know, don't think about consumers as having a very narrowly defined role um, as advocates in a system. They can have influence um, and can serve as assets um, at, at several levels within the system. Next slide, please. So to continue that narrative about consumer experience and leadership as something that can be harnessed for change and improvement in healthcare, we held an inaugural Australian and New Zealand Consumer Experience and Leadership Summit called Shifting Gears in March this year. Uh, it had over 850 delegates. Um, it was a program um, very much owned by consumers. They were presenters, they were panellists, they worked with us to design the program. They were rapporteurs on the day. And you can see the themes that that conference had there. Um, the focus was on change and consumers as change makers. So the whole program was threaded with examples and discussions about where consumers have served as advocates for change and improvement and innovation, drawing from their lived experience and their knowledge of the system and the insights they can bring. That program is available on demand, accessible from our website if anyone was ever interested in uh, looking at that two day or elements from that two day program. Next slide, please. One of the things we're very conscious of too is that the, there's often um, 
an information asymmetry, a power imbalance when consumers are involved in advising governments and working on government task forces, working with researchers. Um, and that's, that's, that can often be an impediment to, to them acting with impact and influence and, and feeling confident to do that. So what some of the small things that we've been doing, and we've got several members of CHF who also do work with their own membership uh, and patient cohorts as well. But some of the things that we've been doing to build capacity and confidence in, in our consumer ag advocacy network um, are some of, some of these examples here on the slide. Uh, three main activities that we've put our effort and energy into. We have um, initiated a program called Collaborative Pairs Australia. Uh, it has its genesis in a program run by the King's Fund originally in the UK. Uh, and that's a consumer clinician leadership development program where consumers and clinicians, we speak about co-production, this is about co-training, um, learn leadership development skills and work together on an action learning real situation project together as part of a development, a joint development experience. And the idea is that it's there to encourage collaborative practice and interprofessional collaborative practice. We have a program called Consumer Link, and this is a program that provides education and training and knowledge exchange to a network of around 100 consumers we support nationally who are involved in senior advisory roles to government and government agencies. And that's really designed to empower them and to do what we can do to support them to effectively use their voice. And our very big ambition um, is something we're starting to formulate now, which is to establish an Australian Consumer Leadership Academy. Next slide. So what are some of the practical things? I've spoken about consumers as serving as change agents. What does that look like practically in some of the things that we've supported as CHF? One of the things we did, because we heard that, that, that it was very important for patients that they don't go to primary care services for medical reasons alone, 20% of patients go to GPs here in Australia for social needs. We'd heard about social prescribing. We really wanted to talk to patients and start, start advocating for what that might look like as a national scheme here in Australia. So one of the things we did was to hold a thought leadership roundtable, really to come up with a local design. When I say local, I mean a national Australian-based plan for what a national social prescribing scheme could look like here. We've heard uh, how COVID has disrupted the health system, exposed fault lines, but also created opportunities such as telehealth. So last year, we, we established a consumer commission. This was a group of 30 lead consumer advocates from around Australia who we brought together to look at, to examine, to inquire into what was it about COVID that was good, what was what were the fault lines that it exposed and what would they recommend needed to happen about that? So that was a major policy report produced as a result of that project called Making, Making Health Better Together that we have published. <clears throat> and we believe in critical mass. So every two years we run uh, an Australian Health Consumer Sentiment Survey where we talk to and survey over 5,000 patients about their views and experience on health. And we run a monthly poll on really topical issues uh, that are in the media, for example, around healthcare through our platform called Australia's Health Panel. And that's a panel of about 100, uh, 800 people we survey regularly. Next slide. So they were some more contemporary examples of where we, we support consumers to serve as uh, change makers and change influencers. And these are some of the others, and I'll leave, it, I'll leave my talk with this slide. So we've got a big primary healthcare reform, 10-year plan in development here in Australia, 
consumers have been front and centre in that. We've got a national medicines policy and a health technology assessment review underway. They're also central in that. Uh, there's a consumer reviewer on the independent expert panel developing our new national medicines policy. We've been very active in, in advising on the widespread adoption of telehealth and my health record. And we've been very active also in making sure and supporting consumer voices were at the table, particularly around the development of some ethical decision-making frameworks uh, and the construct and dissemination of consumer information and awareness in association with the COVID-19 pandemic. So hopefully that's given you a flavour of how we see consumers as change agents and some of the impacts um, that consumer voice or patient voice is having here in Australia. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Leanne. Uh, where before the speakers focused on what healthcare providers can do to be better at providing healthcare, uh, Leanne has um, discussed with us the things that the patient, or in this case, the consumer, as they call them now, how consumers can become change agents as well as leaders in healthcare, and that how patients should actually be participants in their own healthcare. So now we go to our third speaker, Ms. Nipita Prasopa Pleiser who is with the Maternal and Child Health and Quality Safety Unit of the World Health Organization Western Pacific Regional Office. And um, Nitita is going to uh, be joining us to discuss her version of uh, what we should be doing as patients and uh, healthcare providers. Thank you very much for being with us, Nitita. Please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cher. And I would like to acknowledge Professor Lee and Leanne Wales, uh, the speakers before me. I apologize for my um, setting. The lighting is not on my side because I'm in the office and uh, my desk is uh, against the windows. Uh, actually, Professor Lee and Leanne has made my job a lot easier because they have said all the things that I would like to say. Basically, they have said all the right things. So basically, I would just emphasize messages from WHO, which you will see that they are actually consistent with uh, what Professor Lee and Leanne has said already. Next slide, please. Uh, next, thank you very much. So basically, uh, patient and family engagement in the Western Pacific uh, region uh, is part of a, of a big picture, basically a regional priority. Uh, our uh, regional director, Dr. Takeshi Kasai, um, he basically, when he came uh, uh, into the, the post of regional director, he and member states have the shared vision for the future towards the healthiest and safest region. Uh, next slide, please. And in this uh, regional priority, um, patient safety, healthcare quality in which patient engagement is uh, embedded is part of the big uh, um, strategies. And the strategy, uh, not the um, the vision. Okay, the vision for the future. There are four thematic priorities, and what we call operational shift. And we, you will see that on the operational shift, health system. So all the things we would like to achieve, we employ a health system approach. That's what it is. And the thematic area is health security that includes antimicrobial resistance. NCDs and aging, climate change and the environment, and reaching the unreached. And these are the key areas. And all these areas, you will see that there are people in there, and patients are in every priority areas. Next slide, please. So we talk about patient engagement. Uh, this is not a new story. Back in 2004, and then 2005, uh, you know, 2004, when uh, WHO started the World Alliance for Patient Safety, Patients and, and Family Engagement, uh, known as Patients for Patient Safety, was part of the 
original key priorities of the World Alliance for Patient Safety. And so I spent some time working uh, with HQ and we did, you know, internal research and we asked people what really matters to them. And these are their answers. What do they expect from healthcare? So they expect healthcare to take care of them. Listen to them, exactly what Professor Lee had uh, emphasized. Show them respect as an equal person. Yeah, this is an imbalance well, in some countries, but patients say, look, I would like to be a partner as an equal. Sharing necessary and important information with them, including risk, including, including cost including implications. So that's, they want to know so that they can make informed decisions. They want their questions to be answered and they would like to know what's next. So these are the key things that patients want to know from our research. Next, please. Um, next slide. So I, would, I just want to show that there are some examples of WHO frameworks or strategies or global actions and every single one of them will have people at the center. So you may recognize this, uh, this uh, strategy, this framework. This is a global strategy on people-centered and integrated health services. Basically, patient is only one person in a very complex healthcare system that experience every step of the care pathway. There are many providers along the way. There are many. Uh, advocates, there are many support groups, but the, the people, the persons who walk all the way, it's them, patients and their families. Next, please. Um, so basically, um, along these, you know, uh, these years, um, many years have passed, a lot of research has been done. And research has confirmed what we believe before, that is, Patient engagement help improve their health literacy. It helps them to be active. It provides them with opportunity to be active in their own care. So when they are active, contribute to their own care, what happens? They are less likely to basically to have further complications or issues because they are better adhered to treatment plans, to prescriptions, to doctor's advice. They are also very likely to make informed decisions to adopt a healthy lifestyle. They can make changes to themselves because they are informed, because they have better health literacy. And all these things are associated with better health outcomes. When patients are you know, having better health outcomes, it means lower cost for healthcare, low burdens for healthcare professionals. This is a win-win situation. Uh, next, please. So basically, uh, WHO also, uh, I think they have just launched. Uh, many of you are there at the table. So patient and family engagement is again, one of uh, the core strategies of the Global Patient Safety Action Plan 2021 to 2030. So patient and family engagement is still a core priority of WHO. Next, please. Uh, so what does it mean? So in Western Pacific region, we are translating global policy, regional policy into a very practical actions. And we have a framework. So in the Western Pacific region, patients, patient and family engagement, patient safety, healthcare quality, this is part of a system approach that we are uh, working with member states to improve their health system. Because to achieve universal health coverage, patient safety is core, is the key. And to achieve universal health coverage, we need to have strong, high performing health systems. And quality is one of the key five attributes requiring for strong health system. And within that quality, engaging people is also a core strategy, as you can see. So uh, basically, a patient's family engagement is part of the efforts towards achieving universal health coverage. Next, please. So 
okay, we talk about uh, COVID-19. Okay, this is a this is a care pathway that we uh, uh, use in the Western Pacific regions to advise member states. I will not go into the care pathway as a whole journey. I just would like to point out that, uh, as you know, uh, responding to COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, the efforts are still ongoing, but the core strategies, the core uh, efforts and the core, you know, outcomes, in fact, they are all patients. The care part, they start with patients. You know, patients go into healthcare and there are care pathways for them to go. So the key success of COVID-19 uh, is very much depends on patients and providers in collaboration. They make the efforts together. So as you know, to detect, to identify cases, we require people to turn up for tests. We require people to self-isolate or to adhere to measures for prevention, to, uh, you know, to uh, adhere to basically treatment plan and also to enter the healthcare system when needed. Yeah, so it requires people. Um, also, collaboration from people is very important. Many countries are now rolling out vaccines. Vaccines, well, they are, you know, some, you know, uh, how you call it, perceptions about vaccines. Vaccine is good. That is not all vaccines are effective that are approved by WHO. We require cooperation from people also to turn up, to come and receive vaccination. So as you can see, everything depends on patients. Uh, next, please. So patients are key partners. So in the Western Pacific regions, we are starting a new initiative called Strengthening Capacity for Patient and Family Engagement for Patient Safety. Why do we specific for patient safety? Well, basically safety is a foundation, it's a core issue of quality. Therefore, we start from there. When we start with the safety, it will spread to quality, it will start uh, to spread to integrated health services because as I mentioned, patient is the one who walks the whole journey of healthcare. So how do we engage them? Okay, so our thing is we focus on capacity strengthening because we require capacity of healthcare providers and we also require capacity of the patients to make the engagement, to make the partnership successful. Start from services basically is their own care. How can we engage patients to be competent in looking after themselves, in looking after their families? Uh, this is at the service delivery. So what we do with this project is we are creating a guide and we are uh, recruiting a hospital, maybe one or two hospitals. We found some hospital already to be the one who will implement the guide step by step because healthcare providers are busy. They don't have the time to translate every policy. So we translate policy to action that they can implement. So they are step and they can choose to engage for services. The key focus of services is their, the patient's own care, particular self-care. Now self-care, they can look after themselves at home when, or when they go back from the hospital or they can be informed to choose healthy lifestyle. Include in the systems. For example, some system, system that have uh, implications for safety and quality, like for example, uh, healthcare accreditation. That is one thing, auditing. All these system things, if you have the voice of the patient, it will make the system more people-centered. It will make the system truly reflects the needs and the preference uh, and the, uh, you know, the voice of the patients. So we have the step on that as well. In policies, uh, I should say that our guide is focusing at care um, at the facility level, because that's where health care and services happen. That's where interaction happen as well. Policy here, we mean policy at the system level, at the hospital level. 
and policy in uh, engaging in policy, there are many levels as well, from consultation to participation as advisory to to being part of the um, the hospital uh, management system, depending on the facility. Research. Research is another key component because research informs policy. Research informs the monitoring and the evaluation of services. These are the key that we, so our guide focus on these key areas. Next, please. Uh, so basically what we want to do is that what we, I think uh, IAPO um, uh, and us work together very closely on putting the care into healthcare. What we mean here, care means compassion. And I think our speaker talked about that. We need, compassion can be cultivated by improving communication, understanding each other, uh, patient understand healthcare providers, healthcare providers understand patient. You know, mutual understanding can uh, build into trust, trust built into respect. But compassion is very important in healthcare. Uh, access. Access is important. And access to healthcare and services, access to participation as well, access to a decision making process. Decision making process for their own care, for example, that is about access. So, access is very important because when people have access, they can also develop their skills, their capacity. So they can develop and cultivate compassion as well when people have access to information, communication, services, for example, respect. We have heard a lot about respectful care, but what does respect mean? So what we want to see in our project, respect means it has to come from the perspective of patients and providers and how do we fine tune them? What are important to patients? What do they consider as respectful care? We need to hear from them. We can't defy it for them. We must learn from them and hear their voice. Empowerment. Empowerment is about, we can't empower people, but we can help them, them to be empowered. And the best way to be empowered uh, for people is to have the right information, have access to information, Accept to the right care at the right time. Uh, basically, it's about universal coverage. Basically, they are, when they are respected, they feel empowered as well. Uh, so when they are able to participate, they also feel empowered. When they improve their health literacy, they feel empowered. And that's what we call empowerment. Next, please. So the roles of patients organizations, for example, like IAPO, patients organizations have very important role to help healthcare system realize care and putting the care into healthcare. For example, I, I show, there are many more, but I give some example. To help promoting uh, compassion, compassionate care, for example, communication. Patient organizers have a very key role to help facilitate the communication, uh, to help coordinate patient, patients in policies, in services, in capacity building. C can also mean capacity. Building capacity of patient is one of the very key roles that patient organizers can do. In fact, this is what uh, very important. It is a starting point is to build their capacity. In terms of access, you must, patients must continue to advocate uh, for patients to act, to have access to healthcare, access to participation, access to decision make process. In fact, is to platform, to a mechanism to have their voice heard. So that is very important. So along the way, advocacy will help also change people's attitude. Because when people become more informed, when healthcare providers understand patients, they become more informed. And when they become more informed, both sides, the attitude can change. Uh, I'll give an example. This is in another country where there was a picture of a, a doctor looking at a mobile phone. 
And then there was a criticism on Facebook and they, oh, doctor, uh, don't play Facebook. Look after your patient. But the explanation come in and say, the picture of the doctor looking at the mobile phone is that he is telemedicine. You know, he's doing a telemedicine with a doctor in a bigger hospital to seek second opinion. So when patients understand that, their attitude towards home care providers change. So this is the power of communication. Communication can change attitude, but they need to have access to that information. Respect. Respect, the patient organization can represent the voice of the patient, but you need to represent every voice. Every voice is important, regardless of how big, how small, whoever they are, wherever they live, whether they are men, women. Representation is very important to help them uh, uh, to be heard, but also representation can also help to empower them. So empower, to empower, to help people to, em to feel empowered, engagement is key. Engagement means give them access to participate, give them access to collaborate, give them access to a platform to make them to make their own decision. They may decide not wanting to do anything. They may decide they want to join. They may decide, no, I don't want to engage. And that is still their decision. But at the minimum, we need to engage them to give them the power to make their own decision. Important health literacy is important because if patients are healthy, they are better able to engage. They are better able to communicate. They are better able to access and contribute. For healthcare providers, you are also in need of capacity building, of improving literacy. That is the literacy about your patients. You need to understand not just their disease, but their situation, their circumstances, their environment, their uh, health uh, determinants that influence their health conditions, their diseases. So empowerment can work both sides. That is why I have the circle there. Both providers and patients are in here together. So next please, in conclusion, I think patient organization has a role to build capacity for both patients and healthcare providers. Your role is very important because you are the one who represents the voice of the patient. You are the one who help them to advocate for their access. You are the one who help communicate, to coordinate, to build their capacity for compassionate health. I will stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nitita, for providing us inputs on how patient and family engagement can result in a healthier um, population and a safer health system. Uh, we do not have very much time, only six more minutes to go. So uh, we only have time for two questions. We have them. Um, given to us and may I ask any one of the three of our speakers to answer first, uh, what are the challenges of integrating the health system? And um, the questioner is suggesting that uh, it might be silos or it might be political will. Which one is it? Or if it's not those two, what is it? Anyone would like to answer that question? Yeah, Professor Lee, would you like to? Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, my view is, is that for, as the word says integrated, it is everyone's responsibility and uh, everyone has a role in how we integrate the system, right? From the uh, ministry uh, coming up with the framework, the processes and the incentive schemes to the healthcare provider, to have uh, not just the skills and capabilities and the willingness, but also, as we have shared earlier, the correct ethos and the correct values uh, to want to collaborate with the rest. 
because I think uh, in any collaboration, in any integration, it is not just about having a good framework in place or a good process in place. It is about the relationship that we build. Do we trust each other? Uh, can we talk to each other in the first place? And are we having a common goal and a uh, common mission that we are seeking to? And then we come to the uh, providers themselves, uh, that whether it is the caregiver, or formal or informal caregiver, they, they should feel part of the process and that their in inputs are taken into consideration. And patients themselves, I think, have a role to play uh, in this whole integration system because they have to want to take responsibility for their health, but we have to enable them and empower them to do it. So, so I would say that uh, everyone has a role and if uh, one or more party in it uh, doesn't play that role, then it will be difficult to, mm -hmm. to have that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Would any of the other um, speakers want uh, to comment? Yes. Uh, yes, Nitita here. Thank you, yes. Professor Lee. I echo Professor Lee that it is everybody's responsibility. Uh, I think that is very true, but also for healthcare providers or healthcare facilities, I think we also need to make the systems, you know, friendly, make the systems um, uh, make it to become enabling factor, not hindering factors. For example, if a patient goes to a hospital for a, an appointment, clinics that provide related services should be connected. So why one card that details appear everywhere, for example. And also, for example, if they need to go to appointment, different clinics, they should be able to visit or they need to within just, just to give an example, meaning the system needs to allow that to happen. That's number one. Number two, capacity. What do I mean here? Capacity of the system of the providers, meaning they have the ability to operate the system, make it easier for patients, but also patients have the capacity to use the system well. I give example of some countries, patients can actually make their appointments online. So if they know how to do it, have to do it, but the system also support them to do it. This is one another thing. A silo has been used. Uh, yes, I agree. Therefore, I think multi-sectoral approach, not just health, uh, outside health as well, like linking if, about children, linking to school, linking to the workplace, make it easier for people to access care and services. So multi-sectoral approach, multi-level of government's approach as well. Like each level of the government have consistent policy, consistent enabling factors to support people. Also, I think the competitive environment for funding within the system, uh, that is one way to help reduce silo, uh, making it easier for healthcare providers to share information and to collaborate for the patients. Thank you. Thank you, Nitita. And I think we will ask Leanne to uh, comment on the second question, which is, um, uh, do you think fragmented health system pose a patient safety risk? And if yes, how? I think it does pose uh, a, a patient safety risk. Um, I think the, the, to answer that, it's probably good. It's probably a good idea to give some examples of where a fragmented system can create a risk, um, and that's in areas such as uh, handover. You know, so poor handover and poor communication between providers. If someone's leaving hospital to go back into community-based or home-based care or back into the aged care system, particularly around areas like uh, medication. Uh, transfer and medication misadventure. We know from a lot of research done in Australia here, that's, that's where a lot of medication misadventure occurs. That's costly to the system, but also a great potential safety risk to patients. Um, and it's not so much a, uh, you know, a fragmented system, apart from being a risk to patient care, um, it's also, it doesn't make for a very good experience of care either. Um, you know, it's very much a catch cry here that patients uh, experience disconnected care, fragmented care, um, having to tell their story several times over, 
um, having to get uh, repeat tests when that's not necessary if, um, uh, you know, there was better coordination and that the systems and infrastructure facilitated better coordination and sharing of test results and those sorts of things between care providers. So it's a risk to patient safety, but fragmented care systems are also a risk to um, they erode the potential for high value care and often result in low value care being delivered. Thank you, Leanne. And I'm afraid we have run out of time. So uh, I will thank our distinguished speakers, Professor Lee, Ms. Nikita and Ms. Leanne for your very important and valuable inputs in our session on uh, this morning's uh, third Asia Pacific Congress on Patient Care. Uh, and also want to thank the organizers for having us here and wishing the participants a very good Congress. Thank you very much.